Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week, so if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bells that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week we are going to be talking about the solved case of Philip in Hoffer. He was a man in his late 50s who was brutally murdered more than 30 years ago in the early 90s. When Philip's body was found, a murder investigation was quickly set up by the police. The hunt was on to find his killer. And it wasn't long until the police actually identified a suspect in the case. The only problem being they had absolutely no idea where this suspect was. They appeared to have gone on the run, but the police knew that they had to find them quickly before they potentially killed again. But just before we get into the case, I would like to say a massive thank you to Babbel for kindly sponsoring this section of the video. Now, it's the start of January, the start of a brand new year, which for a lot of people, including myself, means new resolutions, new goals that we set ourselves for the 12th months ahead. Maybe one of your resolutions this year is to eat a bit healthier or to save more money. Maybe it's to learn a new skill or hobby, maybe even a new language. And that is where Babbel comes in. Babbel is a language learning app that I have been using for months now and I absolutely love it. I'm currently using Babbel to learn Italian but there is a huge variety of different languages that you can learn on there. You can learn French, Spanish, German, German, Dutch, Russian, the list goes on. But as I just said, I'm using it to study Italian because I really want to visit Rome at some point in the next couple of years. Babbel teaches you real world practical conversations. So for example, I'm on course two right now and I'm currently learning how to say where I'm from and also how to ask where someone else is from. I've literally just learned that Didovese means where are you from. Babbel will teach you in multiple different Different ways that are really engaging and enjoyable so that you don't get bored of learning the language through just one method. They'll teach you through reading, writing, listening and speaking tasks. They can also teach you through podcasts and games and they also offer live classes with top language teachers. In fact all of the lessons on Babbel are actually created and designed by real language teachers and the lessons themselves are short. They're usually like 10 minutes long at the most, which I really like because it means that even when I've got a super jam-packed day and not much spare time on my hands, I can still squeeze in a quick 10 minute lesson and keep up with my learning. Voi siete spagnoli? Voi siete spagnoli? Voi siete 10 out of 10. I just think that learning a new language would be the perfect goal to set yourself in 2022. So if you would like to give Babbel a go, then I have an amazing deal which you can use. If you click the link in the description box of this video, you can receive up to 65% off your subscription with a 20 day money back guarantee. Once again, thank you so much to Babbel for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. And now let's just get into the case. So for today's case, we are going back more than three decades to the year 1991 in Natomas, which is a neighborhood in the northwest area of Sacramento in California in the US. And one of the residents of the Natomas neighborhood was this man, Philip Inhofer. Philip was 58 years old at the time that this case took place. He was a retired veteran. He used to work in the military, in the Air Force, and his job role was actually master sergeant but he had retired from that role and by the early 90s I believe Philip just had a small part-time job somewhere just to keep supporting himself financially and have something to do really. Philip was a father I think he had just the one child he had a son named Henry who was a fully grown adult by this point and therefore he didn't live with his father. Philip actually lived on his own he wasn't married he wasn't with Henry's mother he was 
was a single man, but he was still very well liked. People only really had nice words to say about Philip. They spoke of him really highly. He was a good dad to his son, Henry. He wasn't there for Henry as much as he would have liked whilst Henry was growing up, purely because of his job. Obviously working in the military, he did move around a lot and he was very, very busy. But now that he had retired from that and he was settled in Sacramento, he was spending more and more time with his son and also his grandchild. Philip was a grandfather too. And overall, he was described as being just a kind, gentle and caring man. And as I said, Philip lived on his own. He lived in a mobile home in a mobile home park called the Stadium Club Estate, which was located in Natomas in northern Sacramento. And it was apparently a mobile home park that was filled with mostly older people like Philip, people who had also retired and just kind of wanted a quiet life. The park was in a very quiet and calm and peaceful area and it was surrounded by fields so it was very secluded and not much really happened there to be honest until at least the year 1991 when Sacramento police were called to a horrific scene at that mobile home park, a crime scene, because someone had been brutally murdered there and that someone was 58 year old Philip Inhofe. On the evening of the 7th of March 1991, Philip's son Henry Inhofe went to visit his father at his home in the mobile home park in Natomas and the reason Henry had gone to see his father that evening was actually because he had received a phone call I think earlier on that day from his father's work. They were basically asking if everything was okay with Philip because he hadn't turned up for his shift that day. So Henry went to go and check on his father, check that everything was okay. He went to the mobile home park and when he walked towards his father's home, he immediately noticed that none of the lights were on in there, but he entered the property anyway. He started looking around for his dad and very quickly, Henry stumbled upon a gruesome, horrifying scene. As he was searching the home, Henry opened a small closet and inside of that closet, he found the body of his father, 58 year old Philip Inhofe, and he was dead. And when Henry made this awful discovery, he quickly picked up the phone and he contacted the police. One of the first officers to arrive at the scene was homicide detective John Cabrera, who would go on to be one of the lead detectives in this case. And when the police got to the mobile home, they went to that small closet and there they also found the body of Philip Inhofe. He was on the floor, he was lying on his stomach face down on the floor and he was just in a pool of his own blood. From what I can gather, Philip was naked when he was found, however he was absolutely covered in blood. There was blood everywhere and it was immediately obvious just from looking at his body that this blood had come from the many, many stab wounds that Philip Inhofe had sustained. It was later determined in his autopsy that Philip had been stabbed with a knife more than 30 times. However, not just with one knife. The killer used two, two different knives. And the reason they used two knives, the police believe, is because one of them actually broke off inside of Philip's body. When he was found, detectives noticed that the blade of a knife was sticking out of his collarbone near his neck area. So the killer had clearly used so much force when they plunged the knife into Philip's body that it caused it to literally break inside of him. But instead of stopping at that point, they just grabbed another knife and they carried on with the attack. However, stab wounds weren't the only injuries that Philip had sustained. It was also determined that he'd been hit in the head repeatedly over and over again with some kind of heavy blunt object. And he had been hit so hard and so many times 
that his skull was fractured and they believed that this object was probably a baseball bat although side note none of the murder weapons were actually found at the scene the object that was used to hit him in the head wasn't found nor was the second knife that was used obviously the blade of the first knife was found embedded in philip's collarbone but the second knife and the object that was used to hit philip around the head were not in his home so the killer had taken those away with them. Now the police later learned from one of Philip's neighbours in the mobile home park that sometime around 12am, so very early in the morning on the 6th of March 1991, they actually heard a lot of banging noises all of a sudden just randomly in the middle of the night. So this neighbour got up, he walked outside and he quickly realised that the banging noise was coming from inside his neighbour, Philip Inhofe house and at that point in time when the neighbor realized where the noise was coming from he didn't really investigate because he didn't think much of it his immediate thought was that philip was probably lifting some weights and then dropping them or something and that was the banging noise that he was hearing however of course when the police found this out they instantly theorized that that banging noise was actually the sound of the killer hitting Philip over the head repeatedly with a baseball bat. That neighbour was actually hearing the murder taking place. He just didn't know it at the time. However, this account from Philip's neighbour did provide the detectives with some very important information. They could now pin down exactly what time the murder happened. As a result of his witness statement, they believed that the attack started very late in the evening on the 5th of March, 1990 and it probably ended around midnight on the morning of the 6th and remember Philip's body wasn't found until the evening of the 7th of March so he had just laid dead and undiscovered in that small closet for about two days or just under two days before his son found his body. Now when Philip's body was found a white plastic bag was actually discovered wrapped around his head and this was probably done by the killer just to ensure that Philip would die just in case the stab wounds and the many blows to his head weren't enough just in case he was still alive they tied a plastic bag around his head so that he would suffocate to death. Although another theory as to why the bag was tied around Philip's head was that perhaps after committing the murder the perpetrator actually started to feel some guilt and remorse and they just couldn't bear to look at Philip's face so they put a bag over it so that they didn't have to. So as you can gather this was an incredibly brutal and violent murder. Philip had suffered such a painful death and the person who did this was clearly so so dangerous so the mission was on for the police to catch them as quickly as they could in the beginning of the investigation the detectives needed to work out exactly what had happened here this murder had clearly taken place in the victim's home in philip's home but the police wanted to work out exactly where in the home it had started because as we know philip's body was found at dump in that small closet but the police didn't believe that that's where he was actually killed. Detective John Cabrera soon came to the conclusion that the attack probably started in the bathroom of the mobile home specifically in the shower. In fact it's believed that Philip was probably having a shower when he was first stabbed. As I said earlier he was naked when he was found and there was so much blood in the shower. It was all over the bathtub, all over the walls, the tiles, on the floor, on the shower curtain and the shower curtain itself had a lot of like rips and cuts in it where it's theorised that the killer was literally stabbing Philip through the shower curtain. Drops of blood were also found on the ceiling, I think in another room in the home, so it's theorised that Philip, after being stabbed in the shower, he tried to run out of the bathroom and fight the attacker off, and this all would have happened so quickly that Philip didn't even have the chance to put on his glasses. His glasses were next to the shower, and I believe he was pretty blind. He didn't just need glasses for, like, reading or something, 
something like that, he needed them to see. But he wasn't able to grab them and put them on because he tried to run out and escape the murderer. And when he staggered out of the bathroom shortly after this is when they grabbed the baseball bat and they started hitting him around the head. And the blood on the ceiling, I imagine, was from where there was blood on the baseball bat and the killer was swinging it above their head and then bringing it back down to hit Philip. Each time they raised it and swung it back, even more blood would be splattered onto the ceiling. Following this is when they put the plastic bag over Philip's head and then it's believed they dragged Philip's lifeless body into the closet and they shut the door. And it did actually appear as though attempts were made by the killer after the attack to clean up the scene a little bit. They tried to wash some of the blood away and get rid of the stains, which unfortunately did mean that a forensic team struggled to find any trace of the killer's DNA. And of course, we do have to remember that this was the early 90s when DNA and forensics was still very much in its early stages and therefore not as advanced and as useful as it is today in criminal investigations. Now there were no signs of forced entry to the mobile home so the killer hadn't broken into the property which indicates that Philip must have let them in willingly suggesting that he might have actually known the perpetrator personally and he didn't feel as though there was any threat. And another thing that suggests this was the fact that Philip was attacked in the shower, the fact that he was having a shower whilst knowing that this person was inside his home implies that he felt comfortable around them. And again, he clearly didn't think for one second that he was in any danger whilst being in their presence. So now that they had pieced together the crime scene and worked out that the offender was probably someone that Philip knew, the next thing to determine was the reason for this crime. What was the motive for this callous murder. And very quickly, one motive became clear when Philip's son Henry told detectives that his father's car was gone. You see, Philip owned a red 450 SL Mercedes Benz. It was an expensive car and it was usually parked just outside of his mobile home in a carport. But when Henry arrived at the scene and the police arrived, it was not there, it was gone the killer had stolen it. So was this the motive for this attack? Did someone really take this man's life in such a brutal way just for his car? It seems absolutely insane, but at this moment in time, that was the only obvious motive. The rest of the home wasn't like ransacked or anything like that at first glance. It didn't seem as though anything else had been stolen. It was just the car that was gone. Now, as part of the murder inquiry, the police were obviously looking into Philip's life, looking into his family, his friends, work colleagues, just trying to determine whether any of them could have been capable of doing something like this and whether any of them had a problem with Philip. Was there anyone that would have wanted this man dead? Although this didn't really result in anything. As I mentioned earlier, Philip was very well liked by people that he knew. He didn't have any issues with anyone but they carried on looking into his background and the people that knew him anyway and in the meantime other detectives were still looking for evidence and clues at the crime scene in Philip's home. They started searching Philip's own bedroom to see if they could find anything of significance in there and they actually did. Next to Philip's bed on his bedside table, they found a piece of paper and written on this piece of paper was a phone number and a name. And the name above the number was Jade Cabading. So immediately the detectives are thinking, okay, this might be a lead here. Maybe this Jade Cabading knew something about Philip's murder. Maybe she knew some information that could possibly provide a breakthrough in the case. Or maybe she herself was involved. Maybe Jade Cabading was Philip's killer. So in an attempt to find out more about this Jade, the police spoke to Philip's friends and family members and just asked them about her, asking if they knew who she was and where the police could locate her. However, none of them 
recognized the name they had no idea who this jade cabinet was and why philip had her name and number on his bedside table however as detective john cabrera continued looking into philip's life and taking a deeper dive into his private life he discovered something about philip something which the police thought could possibly link back to this jade cabinet detective john cabrera found out that before his death philip would often use the services of sex workers he was a man in his late 50s he was living on his own and he would get lonely so he would turn to sex workers for company so it was at this point when the police found this out that they started thinking that maybe that's what jade cabbaging was maybe jade was a sex worker that philip was in contact with if she was it makes sense why her name and phone number was on his bedside table when his body was found now as all of this was going on as they were learning all of this the police were also going through philip's phone contacts and his telephone records to see who he had been in touch with in the lead up to his death and one number in his phone records instantly stood out to the police because i believe this number had only rang for Philip once he had no other connection to this phone number but the call had been made on the day of Philip's murder so the police were obviously intrigued to see who this was and so they just rang it they rang this number and when they did a man answered the phone and they asked this man a couple of questions including well number one why is your number in the phone records of a man who has recently been brutally murdered and they also asked him do you know of anyone called jade cabbaging and this man said yes he said that he did remember having an encounter recently with a woman named jade he said that jade had actually been in a car accident on the day of philip's death i believe and it wasn't too serious it wasn't like a major accident i don't think but this man was driving by when it happened and so he pulled over and he stopped to see if everyone was okay and one of the people involved in the accident was this jade and she asked him if she could use his phone to make a quick call to a man that she was going to see in sacramento and she actually told this man that she was headed to sacramento to pick up her mercedes-benz car it turns out that the phone call jade made using this man's phone was to philip inhofer who lived in sacramento and who owned a mercedes-benz the mercedes that was later stolen by his killer so the detective continued asking this guy for more information did this jade tell you anything else about what she was doing or just about herself and he just said well she did say that she worked as a sex worker and that she often worked at a place called the mustang ranch now the mustang ranch was a brothel located in the state of nevada in the u.s and it was a very very popular and well-known brothel it used to have a lot of customers who all went to obviously see the women that worked there one of which the police now knew was jade cabbaging although what they soon discovered was that jade cabbaging wasn't actually this woman's real name jade was um her work name like her sex worker name her actual name was michelle comiskey and she was just 19 years old at the time that this case took place in march of 1991 so now that the police knew even more about jade or michelle i should say now they knew her real name they knew that she had a connection to the murder victim philip in hoffer and they knew where she worked they decided to actually go to the mustang ranch in nevada to see if michelle was there and if they could speak to her about the nature of her relationship with philip however when they arrived Michelle was not there she was not at the Mustang Ranch and so because of this instead the detectives started speaking to the other women that worked at the Mustang Ranch Michelle's 
co-workers i guess and they were more than forthcoming to the police they were very willing to answer any questions the detectives had about michelle comiskey it kind of seemed like a lot of the other sex workers that worked at the mustang ranch didn't really like Michelle too much and the reason they didn't really like her was apparently just because she was the most popular sex worker that the ranch had. She was very very liked by all of the regulars, she always had the most customers, she always earned the most money and I think a lot of the other women kind of resented her for that. So as I said they were very willing to provide the police with as much information about Jade or Michelle Comiskey as they they could and it was during this that the police learn of something that happened in Michelle's past something that was very very alarming and did indicate that she was capable of doing some very evil things now there isn't really much information online about Michelle's younger years like her childhood years I believe she had quite a normal upbringing up until her teenage years she had a brother however her parents were separated and she and her brother lived with their father in Iowa although around the age of 14 she and her father started having some problems they weren't getting along they were arguing a lot I think and so she actually ran away from home at just 14 years old and she decided that she was going to go and live with her mother instead however she didn't live with her for very long because apparently she didn't get along with her mother's new partner so her stepfather and so after a short while she left she ran away again but she didn't go back to live with her father instead Michelle decided that she was going to go it alone she was going to be independent she was going to try and support herself and so she relocated to Florida at just like 14 15 years old and I believe she was homeless and living on the streets for a while because she didn't have any money obviously she didn't have a job however she eventually got involved in sex work she became a sex worker at a very very young age just so that she could support herself and so that she could pay for food and accommodation and she soon developed a lot of different contacts in the world of sex work she had a list of regular clients that she would often sleep with for money and also she actually got married twice by the age of 19 she had been married to two different men and I think divorced as well I don't think she was still married when this case happened so they were very short marriages and it has been widely reported that she actually tried to kill one of these husbands by poisoning them with rat poison because she wanted the money from his life insurance policy and this was the very alarming thing that the police later discovered about her past thankfully it didn't work because this husband I believe it was her second husband that she tried to poison um, he actually caught her doing it he caught her putting the rat poison into his food and so he obviously didn't eat it but this just shows you what kind of woman she was what kind of evil things Michelle Comiskey was capable of doing she tried to kill the man that she was supposed to love and protect which is terrifying but anyway going back to the sex work eventually she got to the point where she was making a lot of money she was doing really well financially and this meant that she could travel around a lot between the ages of 14 and 19 she visited and she lived in several different cities and states including Phoenix Illinois, Los Angeles, Hawaii, Florida, New York and also obviously Sacramento and eventually she started working at the Mustang Ranch brothel where she made even more money. I'm not entirely sure when she started working at the Mustang Ranch. I'm not sure if she had just started there fairly recently or if she had been there for a while but as I mentioned earlier she quickly became the most popular sex worker there. She was always the one 
that got the most clients because she had this charm about her she was always able to entice the most men and obviously the more men the more money she earned although she would spend this money very very quickly in fact the majority of the money that michelle earned would go on drugs she was addicted to drugs mainly cocaine and lsd in fact her friends would later say that lsd was michelle's favorite drug so that is just a little bit of background information about Michelle Comiskey but going back to where we were in the case so as I said when the police found out about Michelle Comiskey and her connection to Philip Inhofer how her sex worker name Jade Cabarding was on his bedside table and how on the day of the murder she had used this man's phone to contact Philip and she told this man that she was headed to Sacramento to get her Mercedes-Benz car and they found all of this out as we know they headed to the Mustang Ranch where she worked and picked up clients and whilst there they spoke to the other women Michelle's co-workers and friends some of them were actually good friends of Michelle's and interestingly one of the things that they actually told the police was that Michelle had recently been talking a lot about this man this client that she had in Sacramento and how this client had an expensive Mercedes-Benz car this man that she was talking about was obviously 58 year old Philip Inhofer and Michelle told people that she wanted that car she wanted Philip's Mercedes and that she was going to get it one way or another in fact she even told some people that she was willing to kill to get that car so after learning all of this the detectives were certain that michelle had to be philip's killer as we discussed earlier on in the video when philip's body was found it appeared as though the motive for the crime was the theft of his car that was the only thing that seemed to be stolen and now they had identified this woman who had a link to philip and she told people that she was going to get his mercedes-benz car by any means necessary even if she had to kill to get it so they were sure that michelle was the one who did this to philip however at the same time the police didn't actually have enough evidence to secure an arrest warrant yet all of the information they had gathered so far was really just circumstantial evidence they had not yet found any solid proof that michelle was the murderer so as part of the search for more evidence detective john cabrera was literally speaking to as many people as possible he was speaking to and taking statements from pretty much everyone that knew michelle comiskey or jade cabarding and one of these people that he spoke to was a former roommate of michelle's and this roommate provided the police with some groundbreaking information this roommate actually said that on the 5th of march 1991 so the day of philip's murder she actually picked michelle up and she drove her to philip's home on the mobile home park in natomas in sacramento and she also said that on the way to philip's home the two of them stopped at a hardware store michelle wanted to stop there and when they went inside she picked up some rat poison and she actually asked one of the employees if rat poison would make a person sick if you gave it to them and the employee said well yes so now the evidence is really building up against michelle her former roommate's statements place michelle at the crime scene at Philip's home on the day of his death and it also indicates that she was planning to poison Philip she was thinking about buying that rat poison so that she could try to kill Philip just like she tried to kill her second husband with rat poison I believe this roommate did claim that she actually went inside Philip's home for a short while with Michelle however she soon left and she left Michelle there on her own with philip and when the roommate went 
Philip was still alive. So the last time he was seen alive, he was in the company of the main suspect, Michelle Comiskey. A couple of weeks after Philip's murder, on the 25th of March 1991, Detective John Cabrera was able to obtain an arrest warrant for Michelle Comiskey. He was confident that all of the evidence and all of the statements he had gathered so far in the investigation pointed to one person as being the killer and that person was Michelle. So now that he had the arrest warrant, all he had to do was find Michelle, although this would prove to be very, very difficult. It seemed as though after committing this murder, Michelle Comiskey had gone on the run, so a manhunt was set up to try and find this very dangerous woman. Now, the police soon found out through the manager of the apartment building where Michelle lived. This apartment building was located in the city of Citrus Heights in Sacramento County, which is about 16 and a half miles away from Natomas. Anyway, they found out through the manager of the building that just one random day just in the middle of March Jade and her current roommate just picked up and left their apartment without telling the apartment manager and without paying the manager their rent for that month. They literally packed all of their things and just went and didn't tell anyone where they were going. So Citrus Heights was the last place the police knew Michelle definitely was but where she was at this point in time they had absolutely no idea. I mean, she could have been literally anywhere by this point in time. It had been weeks since she went on the run, so she could have made it anywhere. And due to this, Detective Cabrera knew that it was going to be so much more difficult to locate this woman. And so in a desperate bid for help, he turned to the FBI. And when the FBI got involved in the case, they put out something called an Unlawful Flight to Avoid Prosecution Warrant, or a UFA. AP warrant for short. And a UFAP warrant is used when a person is trying to avoid being charged and prosecuted for a crime in a state. And so they go on the run just like Michelle Comiskey had. So this UFAP warrant was issued for Michelle. And I think this very quickly caught the attention of the media. This case caught the attention of the media because it was such a unique one, I guess, because Michelle Comiskey was so different from any other suspected killer that the public had seen. For starters, she was a woman, which is unusual to begin with. Most homicides tend to be committed by men. And she was such a young woman as well. She was barely an adult. She was just 19 years old. And the thought that a 19-year-old girl could have been capable of such a brutal and violent murder was just insane. And in addition to that, the fact that Michelle was a sex worker and that she was very good looking and attractive, she just caught the eye of the media and the public and this case was all over the headlines. Now as the investigation continued, the police actually found out about a storage unit that Michelle had been renting and so they went straight there, straight to the storage unit to see if they could find find any evidence. Maybe they would find something in the unit that could indicate where Michelle had gone, or maybe she had even hidden some evidence in there, such as the second knife that was used to stab Philip, or the baseball bat or blunt object that was used to hit him over the head. We know that they weren't found at the crime scene, so maybe Michelle was hiding them in her storage unit. So the police went to this unit, they searched it, and unfortunately they didn't really find much that could progress the inquiry. There was a lot of stuff in there, but nothing really significant in the investigation. There were a lot of boxes in this storage unit, which I think mainly contained the things that Michelle had in her apartment. So like her clothes and other belongings. Although what's interesting is that the police did find a lot of things relating to bats. Michelle seemed to have a real interest in bats. She had objects and artwork related to bats and Batman. She actually had a tattoo of bats. On the upper part of her left arm, she had a tattoo of like a ring of bats. I'll put a picture on screen. She had another tattoo on her neck, which was meant to look like vampire bites that were dripping blood. And the police also found out from a lot of 
people that knew Michelle that she would proudly tell everyone that she was a Satanist. She was into Satan. She worshipped Satan. Satan told her what to do a lot of the time. Although Detective John Cabrera has said on a podcast that I watched, I'll leave the podcast linked down in the description box actually if you want to watch it. It's really, really good and informative about this case. But he said on a podcast that he did think the whole Satan thing was probably a bit of a facade, an act. She used it to almost excuse what she did, which we'll talk more about later on. But anyway, she told people that she was into Satan. She also made it very clear that she was into things like vampires and dragons, bats in particular. She really loved bats. And when all of this was discovered and revealed, she was actually given a nickname. She was dubbed the Batgirl. And interestingly, the person who actually gave her this nickname, the Batgirl, was the lead detective, Detective John Cabrera. And the reason he did this was because he was really worried that soon the public interest and the media interest in this case would eventually die down. And John really needed to keep this case in the headlines because that was the police's best chance of finding Michelle. She was on the run and she could have been anywhere by now. So they desperately needed to keep her face in the news so that people knew who to look out for. But as I said, John was really concerned that eventually the media would lose interest and move on to something else. And so one day, Detective John Cabrera was speaking to a crime reporter about this case and the reporter asked John to just tell her a little bit more about Philip's suspected killer. And John responded saying that he was calling her the Batgirl because of her deep deep interest in bats and vampires and satanism etc and immediately this reporter and the media in general took this nickname the Batgirl and they ran with it. The name and the story was printed in pretty much every newspaper, it was on every news station and soon the case was known nationwide. Everyone knew the case of Philip Inhofer and the Batgirl, everyone knew the face of Michelle Comiskey which was exactly what the police wanted and needed. All of a sudden, the police were flooded with calls about the Batgirl. They took so many statements from people that knew Michelle Comiskey or knew her sex worker name, Jade Cabading. A lot of people came forward. A lot of men came forward that said they had been with Jade. They said that they had partied with her and they'd done drugs with her. And I think most of these leads didn't really progress the inquiry too much. It was just people coming forward saying that they knew her. Although they did receive a lot of calls with possible reported sightings of her. They received calls from people in Los Angeles. There were sightings of her in Las Vegas, then Phoenix in Arizona. She was constantly on the move. It's believed that she would travel to all of these different places, make friends with some of the people there, party with them, do drugs with them, and then she would leave and move somewhere else. She would never stay in the same place for long, obviously, because her face was all over the news. She knew the risk. She knew that if she stayed in one place for too long, the police would catch up to her because people would recognise her face and contact the police to let them know where she was. The police later found out, actually, that whilst Michelle was in Phoenix, in Arizona, she got a cover-up tattoo. She got this, like, wavy band thing tattooed over the ring of bats on her left arm because, obviously, the bat tattoo was the reason why she'd been given the nickname The Bat Girl. The police had literally said to the public and the media, look out for the girl with bats tattooed on her arm and vampire bites tattooed on her neck. She didn't actually get a tattoo to cover up the vampire bites on her neck, I think because her hair covered that one pretty well, but she did cover up the bats. And I believe even the tattoo artist that covered the bats eventually contacted the police and told them about his encounter with the bat girl. But despite all of the leads and phone calls they were getting, and despite all of the media attention this case was receiving, the police could still not locate Michelle Comiskey. She was constantly one step ahead of the police. As I said, she was 
always on the move and she was giving people fake names everywhere she went and so the police were really really struggling to catch her until eventually on the 7th of May 1991 so over two months after Philip Inhofer's murder Detective John Cabrera finally received the news that he had been waiting for. He was informed that Michelle Comiskey had finally been found and that she had been arrested earlier that day in Biloxi, which is a city in the state of Mississippi, which is hours and hours and hours away from Natomas in Sacramento. So she had made it far. And the reason she was actually found was because basically Michelle and a friend of hers had recently rented a big big um, U-Haul truck and on this particular day the truck was having some problems like mechanical problems and I believe the door on the back of the truck had like come down or something and so they pulled the truck over on the side of the road in Biloxi to try and sort it out however as they pulled it over they were spotted by a police officer and this police officer noticed that in the back of the truck there was a Mercedes-Benz car, the same kind of car that was stolen from murder victim Philip Inhofer. So this officer was a little bit suspicious and so he approached the two women in the front of the truck and he asked the one that was driving if he could see her ID, her driving license. This woman was Michelle Comiskey and she said to the officer, well I don't have any ID on me. So the officer asked Michelle and her friend to step out of the truck and he started asking them about this Mercedes-Benz car that they had in the back of the truck and Michelle said that it was in there because it was her car and they were on their way to Miami in Florida so they were just transporting it to Miami but this officer noticed that the license plate on the Mercedes had been removed so he took a closer look at it and because the license plate wasn't there he took a note of the VIN number VIN standing for vehicle identification number and when he ran the VIN number through the system, this officer realised that this vehicle belonged to Philip Inhofer, the man who had been brutally murdered two months earlier in Sacramento. So he knew there and then that this woman driving the truck was Philip's suspected killer. This was Michelle Comiskey. Although this vehicle, the Mercedes, was actually silver, and if you remember from earlier on, Philip's Mercedes was red. Well, it turns out that while she was on the run, Michelle hadn't just tried to disguise her appearance by getting the back tattoo covered up. She had also tried to disguise the Mercedes. She removed the license plate and she had it repainted silver because when Philip's body was found and the police realised that his car had been stolen by the killer, they immediately put out an APB on his car and they told the public and the media to be on the lookout for a red Mercedes Benz. So Michelle had obviously seen that and thought, I need to disguise this car because as well as looking for me, everyone is going to be looking for a red Mercedes too. So she got it painted silver. So after the police officer in Biloxi in Mississippi ran the vehicle's VIN number through the system and he realised that it was Philip Inhofer's car and that the woman who had it in her possession was wanted woman Michelle Comiskey, he immediately arrested her and took her into custody and he took Michelle's friend into custody too. And after Detective John Cabrera received the news that Michelle was in custody in Mississippi, he got on the first plane he could and he went straight there. And the following day, he went to interview Michelle and he was really, really hoping that she would confess because at this point in the investigation the police were very 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 confident that Michelle was Philip's killer but they still didn't necessarily have that concrete evidence. I think apart from the Mercedes car being in her possession the majority of the evidence they had gathered so far was mainly circumstantial so John was really hoping that he would get a confession out of Michelle and very surprisingly Michelle actually decided to waive her rights to a lawyer and her right to remain silent and she agreed to talk to John and so the interrogation began and one of the first questions John asked Michelle was are you Michelle Comiskey and do you also go by the name of Jade Cabining sometimes and Michelle 
Michelle's response to this question was very odd. She said something along the lines of, I don't actually know who I am anymore. Although eventually she did admit that she was Michelle Comiskey and yes, she did sometimes go by the name Jade Cavading. And then following this, John asked her just straight up, did you kill, did you stab Philip Inhofer? However, Michelle's response again was quite a strange one. Apparently she started to cry and she admitted that she hurt Philip, but she wouldn't say the words, yes, I did stab him. She would only say that she hurt him. But as the interview continued, Michelle started to open up and talk a bit more. And she talked the detectives through her kind of relationship with Philip and her version of events from the day that Philip died. Now, I believe in her questioning, Michelle actually claimed that she loved Philip. And she said that the two of them met at the Mustang Ranch brothel where she worked. Like I mentioned earlier, Philip was a man who was lonely and so he would often use the services of sex workers and when he went to the Mustang Ranch he met Michelle or Jade Cabading and he fell head over heels for her even though she was only 19. Although saying that, I do believe I read on one source that Philip didn't actually know she was that young. I think Michelle used to lie and say that she was older. But anyway, he met Michelle at the Mustang Ranch and he quickly developed a huge crush on her. He was fixated with her and they started seeing each other, I guess. I don't know. I don't really know how to word that because from what I can gather, Philip saw it as them seeing each other. I think he thought that they were kind of in a relationship. Whereas Michelle probably just saw it as business. This was her job and he was paying her for sex and just for company, I think. Apparently he would buy Michelle a lot of presents and gifts, very expensive gifts too. And they were involved with each other for about three to four months before Philip's death. They met a couple of months before. But anyway, on the day of Philip's death, the 5th of March, 19. 1991, Michelle told Detective John Cabrera that she was dropped to Philip's mobile home by a friend of hers, her former roommate. She actually said that she and Philip went shopping earlier that day and I imagine during this shopping trip he probably bought her some more gifts and presents. But afterwards they went back to his home and she said that later on that night Philip decided to have a shower and she claimed that whilst he was in the shower she took some LSD which if you recall from earlier was her favorite drug according to her friends and Michelle said that for some reason after she took the LSD this time she started seeing things and hallucinating and she said that when she walked into the bathroom instead of seeing Philip in the shower she saw a monster. She saw a horrible monster with snakes coming out of its neck and she said that in that moment Satan spoke to her and Satan told her that she needed to make a sacrifice. She needed to kill this monster in the shower. And so she did just that. She did what Satan told her to do. But again, she wouldn't say the words, I stabbed him or I beat him. She would only say to the detectives, I hurt him. And then following this, she said that the reason she took Philip's Mercedes was because Satan told her to take it. And she also said that the reason she had it painted silver was because again, Satan told her to do that too. So that was Michelle's story. She was basically trying to say that she wasn't really responsible for her actions because the LSD made her have hallucinations and she was mentally ill because she believed that Satan was speaking to her and telling her what to do. Although not many people, including Detective John Cabrera, believed this, believed that she was mentally ill and that she was unable to control what she
she did. But I mean, a lot of the evidence suggests that this was rubbish. What she did after the murder did not indicate to the police that she didn't know what she was doing. I talked about this earlier, but the police actually determined that the killer had tried to clean up the crime scene afterwards. They had made some effort to wipe away the blood and get rid of evidence. So if Michelle was really in this hallucinogenic state where she was speaking to Satan and seeing a monster with snakes coming out of his neck, would she really have been able to clean up the scene at the same time? The police just did not believe her version of events. They believed, what they had always believed, that Michelle went to Philip's home that day with the intention of murdering him. Remember, they even had a statement from Michelle's former roommate, the one who dropped her at Philip's house, and she said that on the way, Michelle literally stopped to pick up rat poison. If that doesn't tell you that she went there that day intending to kill him, I don't know what does. And her motive for the crime suggests that this was planned. Her motive was the car. She wanted his Mercedes car. And if you remember, she even told friends of hers that she was going to get that car one way or another, even if she had to kill for it. The detectives just didn't believe that Michelle was in a psychotic, hallucinogenic state when she committed the murder. They believed that she knew exactly what she was doing. And so after her interview, Michelle Comiskey was extradited back to Sacramento in California and she was charged with the first degree murder of 58 year old Philip Inhofer. After she was charged and while she was being held in jail, the detectives continued looking for evidence linking Michelle to the crime just in case the case would go to trial. They wanted to have as much evidence as possible behind them. So they continued looking for evidence. They got search warrants to go through Michelle belongings and they searched the U-Haul truck that she rented and Philip's Mercedes car which she stole after the murder. Now in the car the police actually noticed some blood stains on the carpet I think in the back of the car like in the trunk and apparently this was from where Michelle had used some towels to try and clean up the crime scene and then afterwards she just chucked the bloody towels in the back of the car and in the U-Haul truck the police actually discovered the murder weapon or at least one of the murder weapons. In the truck they found a baseball bat that had blood stains on it. This was the bat that was used to beat Philip around the head. I don't believe the second knife was ever found. Obviously the first one was embedded in Philip's collarbone um, but Michelle had taken the second knife away with her and clearly disposed of it because I don't think the police ever found it. But they did find the blood-stained baseball bat, so that was even more evidence against her. And on top of that, amongst her belongings, the police also found a notebook. And in this notebook, Michelle had written down the names of all of the clients that she had been with in the past and the amount of money that she had made from each client. And one of the names in this notebook was Philip Inhofer, further proving her connection to the victim. So now the police had a substantial amount of evidence against Michelle Comiskey. They honestly had so much by this point and because she was charged with first degree murder it was looking likely that she would receive the death penalty. And originally at Michelle's grand jury indictment she pled not guilty to murder despite the fact that she confessed. However before her trial even began she changed the this plea. Michelle's defence team basically put forward a plea deal. They said that Michelle would admit what she did and she would plead guilty to her charges as long as the death penalty was taken off the table, as long as she would not be sentenced to death for what she did. And this plea deal was accepted, so Michelle pleaded guilty and that obviously meant that a trial didn't need to go ahead now. Instead, she just had to be sentenced and for what she did to Philip, Michelle Comiskey was sentenced to 26 years to life in prison. So basically life imprisonment with a minimum of 26 years. So she did have the possibility of getting parole one day, which Philip's family were very 
very upset and disappointed about the fact that she could have been released after 26 years because of course she was still such a young woman she was 19 when she committed the crime and i think she was in her early 20s when she was sentenced so if she was out in 26 years she could still have a life even though she stole philip's life apparently michelle does feel remorse and guilt for what she did in march of 1991 while she was in prison a journalist actually wrote to her asking if he could interview her about this crime and i believe she declined the interview but she replied to the journalist with a letter and i have a quote from that letter here she said i live with my murder of mr inhofer every single day as the years go by my understanding and reverence for his life gets deeper sadder i took this man from his family friends and everyday living he deserves life every time i come up for parole i victimize him all over again making them relive the horror i am not the same young woman today i am full moral knowledge of my actions now as i said michelle was sentenced to 26 years to life in prison and it's been 26 years now it's been more than 30 years actually since this crime was committed so you might be thinking well where is michelle today is she still in prison or is she out and the answer is she is out of prison according to sources she became eligible for parole in january of 2020 and she is a free woman now she served about 29 years in prison and then she was let out i believe today she would be around 49 50 years old so like i mentioned before she is still able to go on and have a life despite the horrific murder that she committed but that is it for this case that is the case of philip inhofer i do just want to give a shout out to a podcast i listened to about this case i think i might have mentioned it earlier on in the video but i listened to a podcast about this case which featured the lead detective john cabrera and it was incredibly detailed and informative it's called the quintana show and they do have a youtube channel so i I will leave that linked um, down below and I'll leave the podcast episode linked down below as well if you guys want to go and listen to it. As always, I would love to hear what you guys think about this case. Please do let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments and do let me know of any other cases that you want to see me cover on this channel. Um, again, you can let me know in the comments or I do have a case request form linked in the description box. Thank you so, so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you have haven't already and I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye guys!